welcome back to So Very Wrong About Games. We are now up to episode 25, and I'm here with my good friend, Mark Bigney. How are you today, Mark? I'm Will Walker. It's kind of impressive to know that we've been doing this for a full quarter century. We've been at this for 25 long years. It's, it's amazing. Well, that's certainly what it seems like anyway. It feels that way, and it hurts right here. That being said, today's board game philosophy is a little bit different than usual is this is philosophy that you can't bring across genres. In board games, you can totally manipulate your opponents and change how the game outcome plays itself out. This is very much unlike life. And my main philosophy in life is you can control what you do. You cannot control what other people do. Just do what you do best and leave everything else to everyone else. That being said, once again, we'll change things up, seeing it's the 25th episode. First, we'll talk about games we played this week. Then the news and why it doesn't matter. Our feature game of the week is Lords of Hellas. And our topic is expansions. And are there too many? Who knows? But first of all, what most of you are here for is the contest. We are giving away one Kickstarter Lightbringer pledge level of Massive Darkness. And how do you win said contest? Well, please send me an email at swag.contest at gmail.com. That's S-V-W-A-G dot contest at gmail.com. And in the subject line, you will put the keyword, which is pretentious, followed by one space, followed by your either postal code or zip code. And then in the body of the email, please give me your address with the matching zip code. One name will be picked at random, and they will get the Massive Darkness Kickstarter Edition pledge. Just a reminder, we will uh, subsidize shipping within reason. We'll negotiate it when we select a winner. And it, so if you want to enter in, uh, enter the contest from the uh, deepest, darkest wilds of the Amazon, we can try to work something out, but we'll see what we can do. We are about human, after all. I want to make sure that though this is not being sponsored by CMON or anything else, this is a personal copy that's being just given away out of the kindness of my heart, cough. Yeah, the only official relationship we have with CMON is several restraining orders, but I don't think that this constitutes a violation, given that we are only recording this podcast 501 feet away from their central offices. So true. So this week, I got to play Spirit Island again, ramped up the difficulty, decided to tell the French that they need to move somewhere else, and they said, we beg to differ. Not quite like that. It was in another language that I didn't quite understand. I think it was Latin. I can offer a translation. It was, ha, 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 ha. And I, am, I shouldn't say I'm warming up to Spirit Island, because I always say, I say it is a good game. It's just not a game for me, that's all. You, you still haven't offered much more clarity as to your misgivings I, past that one no, episode we did. But there are no misgivings. It's just, it sure. just doesn't play, to, it doesn't hit me. In any particular way, I think it's. I think it's mostly. I have thought more about it. I think it's just a disconnect. Like there's, they don't. There is theme there, in the in the cards and what they're called and stuff. But just the way the theme works with the mechanisms, like just guys sprouting up out of nowhere and buildings being demolished and ris- rising again. There's no you know real flow to it. I think maybe that just pulls me out a little bit. It certainly isn't one of the thematic powerhouses you enjoy, such as Orleans or Hansa Teutonica. It you know it only boasts some of the best board game writing of the past ten years, so yeah I can I can see I can see your problem. Moving on, Moving Mark, on. what did you play this week? Got to try John Company again. John Company is increasingly interesting as a system. It's one of those games where there are inflection points, and it really is up to the players to seize those points. Because Walker's comment, I think, from a few weeks ago is very much apropos. He said, in a good way, the game kind of plays itself. That's because the structure of the game is very, very smooth and compelling. And the company, it's, it's about running a company. And to a certain extent, you have to be able to step outside the game at crucial moments and decide where you want to try to force the game to go. How do you think you want India to shake out? How do you want the company to shake out? What are you going to be doing with your money and your positions and whatever influence you have at the table? And this is very, very daunting for new players. And so I think 
it really, in order for the game to really shine to its full potential, you really need to be sitting down with a whole bunch of people who know how it works. The, the game that I played was with four new players, four other new players, and it was good. It was just interesting to see how the, uh, the game was kind of taking over the overall structure and flow of things, which again is fine. Part of me wishes that I could sit down with a, a full table of experts and see how they really manipulate the systems to their advantage. But even absent that, I'm more than happy to play in a context where the systems are mostly operating under their own un, under their own authority. And I include myself in this. I'm I'm not able to. I can kind of see the inflection points coming, and then they happen. And I think I should really try to do something clever here. And then there's just this giant ellipsis in my head because I can think of nothing clever to do. And I still enjoy the ride. I just wish I could exert a little bit more control over it. So I'm enjoying my time with John Company, and I'm going to try to get it again to the table. I'm looking forward to playing it again. So I finally got my copy of Altiplano in. It's a, it's a bag-building game, much in the same vein as Orleans is. But unlike Orleans, I think it goes far too long. It really seems to be just all over the place. What did you think of it? So the one bit that I think is definitely an improvement is you cycle through the entirety of the contents of your bag, unlike Orléans, where every turn it's basically a blind draw from your available discs, which is the same innovation for what it's worth that Hyperborea did to the to the bag building genre. You know, it just makes more sense if you want to if you want to be able to plan ahead a little bit more. If the composition of your deck or your bag is to matter, then probably you should go through it all before you start reshuffling, rather than taking a random selection each time. So that that is an advantage. It is a little bit all over the place, but to a certain extent, that was my same objection with Orléans. I don't really find Orléans and uh, Altiplano to be substantially different, except that. As you say, Altiplano is significantly too long. Orléans will reliably clock in at about 75 to 90 minutes, whereas Altiplano seems to want to sit at around two hours, which is much too long for a game of its type. There's already been some uh, semi-official variants on board game to shorten the length, so even the publisher seems to be aware of the problems involved. It's also the case that there's even less player interaction in Altiplano than there is in Orléans, and there wasn't a whole hell of a lot in Orléans to begin with. So mostly you're just staring down at your own little board trying to figure out these specific recipe puzzles. It's like, okay, I need a food and a llama to get this thing. Okay. And then with this thing, I combine it with this other thing specifically at the specific place to get this other thing. And you're just going up this track of conversions. But and I generally don't like conversion, Euro conversion games, but the recipes are all so narrow and specific. In Orléans, you have a lot more latitude about how you satisfy the, the, the various requirements for new things. Same thing with Hyperborea. I mean, as far as bag builders go, Hyperborea is by far my favorite. And a little bit of, a little bit of latitude in how you get to build things makes it just less of a, a strict lattice working puzzle and I, I i just it just didn't grab me exactly at all. and you have the board where you move around and build taverns and stuff and then you have the other tracks that you can manipulate to go up and down i was feeling that if this is the case if your group thought orleans was too complicated and had too much player interaction well altiplano is the game for you because like i said it's, it's a very light or orleans and the player interaction is zero you're right to identify that the rules are lighter. The actual rule systems in Altiplano are very, very, very straightforward. The problem is, is that getting the specific resources you need is very restrictive. Orléans was a bit the other way around. The rule systems were a little bit complicated, but you were able to exercise some flexibility and improvisation, partially by necessity because, again, you're drawing randomly from the bag every every turn. But in Altiplano, it's just the, the building requirements are so rigid it's the kind of optimization puzzle that I tend not to enjoy. And again, it, it certainly didn't help that it was, all told, a far too long multiplayer solitaire experience. Yeah, unfortunately, if I ever, I would pick Orleans over this at any time. So unfortunately, it was a dud for me, but still enjoyed playing it. We also got to play Fairy Tale. Fairy Tale is now about 15 years old. It was originally a Japanese game and it was ported by a variety of publishers. I believe the current printing is by Z-Man. If it, if they are still actively printing it, it's by far my favorite drafting game. In insofar as it is pure drafting, obviously there are lots of other games that involve drafting, such as Blood Rage, or indeed the game that we're going to be talking about today has a little bit of drafting in it. But when it comes to pure drafting, I think Fairy Tale did, does it far far better than anybody else. There's a number of things that it does that are very clever. The play is all very simple and smooth. The way that it facilitates hate drafting, which as as far as I'm concerned is an excellent addition to any drafting game, 
If you like Seven Wonders, for whatever reason, first of all, you have my deepest sympathy for whatever tragic accident has robbed you of your higher senses. But moving past that, if you haven't tried Fairy Tale and you like pure drafting, you're doing yourself a disservice. It's a great, great game. I've been playing it for all the 15 years that it's been my collection. It's one of my favorites. I've, I've played it nearly 100 times by now. Hey, knock a game out in like 15 minutes. It's fantastic. That's all I have on my list, Mark. If it wasn't Altiplano, then it was Lords of Hellas. I've never heard of Lords of Hellas. Is it any good? It's Do pretty wanna... good. Okay. Yeah, and the review's done. Man, that was easy. Yeah, that was simple. Uh, wow. So that, that's been your episode of So Very Wrong About Games. Yeah, we've had, a, we've had a focused week this week. So let's move on to the news and why it doesn't matter. So let me start off with uh, a bit of news that really doesn't matter because it might not even be true. And this is the fact that Asmodee might be for sale. This was first reported in Reuters Business News, and there are rumors that, that Asmodee is soliciting, or at least the venture capitalists who uh, control Asmodee, are shopping around offers. They're looking for, apparently, again, this is all not super confirmed, 1.5 billion euros for the company. So if you've got you know, a billion and a half euros burning a hole in your pocket, and you want to own most of hobby board gaming, yeah, go ahead. There's a lot of speculation about what this would mean, if it sells, if it doesn't sell. I, I think that's all that it is. It's speculation. Speculation based on a rumor. And there's evidence to suggest that it is possible that the whatever whatever venture firm goals they had in acquiring all these board game companies have already paid off. And so now they're looking at the possibility of getting out. Well, with my research, that's what I found as well. The company that bought Asmodee, that's what they do. They take a company and they ramp it up real fast and then they sell it off. So this is just the, the end game of what their what their plan was. My news is just a little more drama in the board game world. There was two games coming out this summer called Forbidden City. One by Reiner Knizia and Jumbo Games. The other one on Kickstarter by our designer of Hans Teutonica, Andreas Stedding. And usually that's not a problem. And the Kickstarter people, you know, said, well, we don't worry about it. Said, you know, theirs is a family game. We're just going to go ahead. But then apparently Jumbo Games trademarked it. And so now first they change it to Forbidden Palace. And now it's another completely game, different name. So why can't people just be happy, Mark? Why must they always cause waves? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. On the topic of more news that really doesn't matter, the Spiel des Jahres released their nominations this week, and quite frankly, I've already lost interest. Back when I first started in the hobby, I used to think that, well, it's called the Game of the Year, it's got to matter, right? Nope. The only thing of note that I would say as far as the uh, German awards go is that they at least recognized one game that, that we here at Swag like very, very much. In the recommended category, it didn't even get nominated, so it was just recommended. In the kids game category, they uh, highlighted Rhino Hero Super Battle. Which is still an excellent game. I played it with children. I played it with adults. I played it with adults who wish they could be children. And I played it with children that wish they could be adults. And it pleases all ages. So at least the SDJ got, jury got something right. The only other side news I have is when I was researching other things, I found out that Kemet's getting a second expansion. So that's kind of exciting. We're going to have a purple pyramids now with more powers and more stuff. You're just obsessed with purple. Anytime there's anything purple added to a game, you're all over it. Guess what? Another player can be played as well. Another additional, was it, sixth player? That, that'll be great. I'm sure that'll work fantastic. More players in the game is always better. <laughs> uh, the final bit of news, I just want to point it out. I don't want to get too deep into the various controversies, but there was initially a very highly publicized thread on Reddit and then a very well-trafficked thread on the Scythe page on BoardGameGeek about the artist Jacob Rosalski. Apparently, some people have been doing some digging on the internet, and they have found images that predate Rosalski's art that is more or less exactly the same. Naturally, everyone went to work on Photoshop, showing various pictures side by side, showing issues, uh, images transitioning over to Jacob Rosalski's art, showing animations of, of all the various images, and then, sure enough, Jacob Rosalski emerged and said, uh, leave me alone, you douchebags. I had a lot of art to produce very, very quickly. So, yeah, I traced some of it. I'm not happy about it, but leave me alone. And there's been a whole bunch of commentary from people in the art world or in the design world, some of which saying this is perfectly okay, some of which saying it's not okay if you don't attribute, some people saying it's not okay really ever in this context. There's also some allegations which are a little more serious that Rosalski might have faked in-progress drawings showing him, quote-unquote, you know, conceptualizing an initial drawing. But that is, that is more speculative. People don't have solid evidence of that. Jamie Stegmeier showed up, and he asked for specific evidence of that latter claim. Again, the faking of prototype art. 
people who have who've attempted to demonstrate that uh, that has not met to uh, Jamie's standard of evidence, and so he's released an official statement on behalf of Stonemeyer Games that Rosalski probably should have uh, cited his his work a little bit better, but they're going full full on ahead with all the art that's been commissioned for Rise of Fenris, the last Scythe expansion. So it's a huge mess, and uh, people got very mad and very worked up. Was it his own art? You mean? Like he modified his own art or modified someone else's art? No, he took other pictures and other drawings of other people and he traced them. Now, again, the extent to which this is problematic, and again, I, I, I don't want to touch on any legal issues because that's that's far beyond my knowledge base or my interest. I don't really care. He at least, the thing that troubles me, the thing that I think is unambiguously troubling is the fact that he acknowledges in his statement that what he did was something he's not proud of and he didn't cite his work. Those two things, I think, indicate what we might call a bit of a recognition that what he was doing was not fully above board. Whether other artists would consider it above board or not is beside the point. He was doing things that he knew wasn't necessarily super awesome. And I I find that relatively troubling. I'm not going to burn my copy of Scythe, uh, but future projects with Jacob Rosalski attached, I might take a little bit of a closer look at, maybe. You have rap people taking bits of music from a bunch of different albums to make their song. And... Well, that's the thing. That's the claim, right? That that sampling is a thing in music, that pastiche is a thing in literature, and where those standards lie is obviously a matter of professional standards. Like, as an academic, the standards of citation might not necessarily make a whole heck of a lot of sense to somebody on the outside. That's why I, I don't necessarily want to judge the practices of any given artist, because that's a world that I don't understand that I'm not familiar with. All of that having been said, there are usually standards with respect to citation, for example. It is the standard in the music world that if you sample extensively, you're expected to give credit and or royalties in those instances. So it's not that it's a practice that's never okay. It's about how you go about doing it. And again, when the artist admits that he went about doing it in a way that he's not proud of. Especially when you're profiting off it. Right. Now on to our feature game of the week, which is a Kickstarter called Lords of Hellas. Lords of Hellas was designed by Adam Kopinski for Awaken Realms. Awaken Realms is a publisher that has a very, very, very short pedigree. The only other project that they've really delivered has been This War of Mine, the board game, which was very late. And they've released this, Lords of Hellas, very late. The next thing that they're slated to release is Nemesis, which blew up Kickstarter in no small way, which will no doubt be very late. If it's on time, I'll eat my words, of course, but uh, I'm I'm, I'm picturing many, many months delay. Now, I have no faith in Awakened Realms because they had a number of very bad fulfillment problems with this war of mine. And of course, it's a first-time publisher. I'll I'll cut them a a fair degree of slack. Adam Kopinski, on the other hand, has a fairly good publishing pedigree. He did some stuff that looks interesting. I always wanted to play them, but I could never get a group together that wanted to try them. He designed a game called Heroes, which was a very interesting real-time dice drafting game. He designed a game called Theomachy, which was basically dressed-up poker with mythology involved. And I thought that both of those games looked very interesting. So at least he's not coming out of nowhere. But finally, the base game of Lords of Hellas has arrived. There's going to be, it being a Kickstarter, a mountain of stretch goals that's supposed to arrive sometime in the future. Basically, when and if it arrives, it'll be like very much like Athena, sprouting spontaneously from her father's forehead, fully armored. But it's not going to be happening as soon as that happens, so uh, we'll, we'll get it when we get it. So what do we do in Lords of Hellas, Walker? What don't you do in Lords of Hellas, Mark? <laughs> you do everything in Lords of Hellas. It is... <laughs> Your heroes going out completing quests and killing monsters. Your troops are rampaging across the countryside, destroying your opponents. You're raising these giant monuments to the Greek gods. You're what? Are, you're sending your priests out to pray and sacrificing them to get more abilities. Just all sorts of that in a bag of cats. Cats, huh? Yeah, I don't know. Hey, throw whatever in. Okay. Well, there is a cat in Lords of Hellas, so there, you know, there's one cat, one dog. I don't know about a bag of cats, but at any rate. So we should start with the theme, I suppose, because that is one thing that I will admit I uh, genuinely appealed to me when the Kickstarter was running. I didn't pledge, but I, I considered it strongly, despite my misgivings about Awakened Realms, because I didn't know that what I wanted was sci-fi, cybernetic, Greek mythology. But it turns out that's what I wanted. Yeah, yeah you, 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 who knew? As soon as you opened the box... That's what you got. Basically, the conceit is that the Greek gods are just highly technologically advanced aliens that showed up, and the Greeks started worshipping them. So, do you want Cyber Cerberus? You can have Cyber Cerberus. 
Do you want Zeus wielding an electrified uh, chainsword? You can have Zeus wielding an electrified chainsword. The components are are, uh, worth mentioning in this context. The components are pretty stunning. Uh, The minis, I think, are very, very good. So what, so what, what are we actually doing in Lords of Hellas? I think if you have played Rune Wars and or Rising Sun, it's sort of a combination of the two. You have these actions that are slowly disappearing off your board, much like Rising Sun. And you have, much like Rune Wars, you have your untouchable hero, who can't be usually locked down by any reason, going around and completing these different quests. And upgrades to your hero, make your troops more powerful and increase your way you can move, increase the way you can play. Much like Rising Sun, there's all sorts of different ways you can achieve victory. There's four different ways to win in Lords of Hellas. You can control five temples. You can kill three of the monsters that are on the board. You can hold one of the monuments that you raised to the Greek god for three turns after it's been completed. The map is divided up into different regions, and if you completely control two of these regions anywhere on the map, that is also a victory condition. So this is why I compare these two closely together. Would you would you think that those are a, a fairly good comparison? It's weird. I'm going to say yes and no, because this is all kind of part of a sort of genre that used to be called a Euro Ameritrash hybrid, but now is kind of sort of its own thing. This is dudes on a map with stuff where there's lots of other stuff going on on top of the dudes in the map stuff. I think you can try to sort of trace the lineage from earlier games like Kemet and Blood Rage, newer stuff like Rising Sun and Inish, also other stuff like uh, Cyclades. Uh, People have compared Lords of Hellas to Inish most primarily, I think because in part the victory conditions are vaguely reminiscent. Inish, there are a number of different ways to win. But in terms of the, the, the fundamental mechanics of what you're doing and how you're going about doing it, the specific mix of things that you're doing, I find each of these games are sufficiently different that lumping them all to, uh, together sometimes is as misleading as it is illuminating. True. I, I was mostly wanted to compare it to Rising Sun for all the blessing cards you get and all the different artifacts and how all of these cards, like in Rising Sun, all the cards that you can obtain during the seasons, completely change the rules and the way, the way you play. Yeah, this is absolutely true of pretty much all of the all of the, the standout games in the genre. You know, in Blood Rage, you're slowly drafting unique powers. In Rising Sun, you're slowly buying unique powers. In Comet, you're also slowly buying unique powers. In Lords of Hellas, there are several different kinds of unique powers, but the two major ones are artifacts and blessings. Let's actually start with the blessings because this is shockingly simple, but I actually really really like how it works. You can build temples, and at certain intervals, and this will change from game to game, the building of a temple will start a Blessings draft. And the Blessings deck is just a stack of special powers, which in turn is populated by cards corresponding to each god. At the moment, there are only three gods available, and so they're the ones that are in every game. But when the avalanche of of Kickstarter expansions hits us straight in the face someday, then that will change. And so you can decide what kind of, of Blessings deck you want. And then you draft, you each get to draft a uh, Blessings card. Now, these Blessings cards are not equally good. I think that's flatly true on the face of it. Some people might disagree about which ones will be in the top tier and which ones will be in the bottom, but I don't think anyone's going to seriously argue that they're all equally good, which is fine because, again, you draft them. However, it matters whether you're going to be at the tail end of the draft or the top end of the draft. But setting all that aside, I really like what it does to the tempo. You start off with a special power by by virtue of your hero. And you don't tend to start off with artifacts. There's one salient exception. But as the game goes on, as the artifacts dribble in and as the blessings dribble in, you really start to feel that very strong differentiation. So yes, in terms of the tempo of how it works, it is very reminiscent of games like Rising Sun where you start off with one power, but then you get a lot more. I just really like the way that that it it's staggered. Different games will see blessings come in at different rates. And that really changes the overall tenor of how the game develops. Since we're on Blessings, I'm wondering if when we, with the four-player game, or now that we can go up to five or six later on, whether, much like these other cards, what I have down here is like, it's almost like a game of flux, this this thing. Because it, it, all these cards change the game so much that by the time it comes back to you, or even, you know, the third or fourth player before you get to go... Their abilities are so changed that what you've prepared for is completely impossible to to try to defend against. 
But that's what I like about the tempo of the Blessings draft. It's a, it's a time for the game to slow down. There's kind of an interregnum. Between turns, everyone pauses, and you do this draft of these powers. And so it's not as though everyone's acquiring them all the time on the reg. And whenever anyone gets a Blessings card, everyone gets a Blessings card. So it's not like they're acquiring them at different rates. And so if you're inclined to really try to internalize the change of the game state, you can. And there is the time to do that precisely because it's this break in the the course of the game. Initially, I found it very jarring because the game flows very smoothly. In Lords of Hellas, the, the turns can be relatively fast, and most of the time they are. And there's no overall art overarching round structure it's just you pick a star player and then you keep going clockwise until the game ends but i really do now appreciate the fact that over the course of lords of hellas there are a couple of opportunities for things to slow down and people to take stock of what's going on let me just hit that why it flows so quickly because all you need to do is quick first you pick a simple action like moving a few troops or moving your hero around do your quick prayer and then you do your major action which you actually mark off on your card and i think there's about seven seven major actions that you can do and once you've done them you cannot do them again until someone's builds does a monument major action which everyone gets to clear all of their actions off and you start again yeah so trying to pick the right time to do the right action and knowing that after picking an action, you might not be able to do it again for quite some time. It's not the best action selection mechanism in the game, but it works. It's it, it's very much like the action selection mechanism in Comet, for example, in that it's fine. It does the job. It throttles what you're able to do in a, in a reasonable way. And while I prefer, uh, I prefer one that's a little bit more robust, like the drafting in... Blood Rage or the drafting even in Inish, which is a game I don't really like very much, but I did at least enjoy the drafting so far as it goes, but I think it works perfectly fine. When somebody builds a monument, which is kind of sort of the game clock in a, in a, in a weird way, everything flushes, so everybody resets everything. The person who actually selected the monument action usually gets a benefit in the form of some extra priests, and priests are very, very important in this game because they're disposable and they give you very good uh, advantages. So there's some benefit in doing that, but it does feel in other ways kind of like passing. Fortunately, however, as Walker identified, before you take this quote-unquote special action, you do get to move some troops, you do get to move your hero, you get to, you do get to do some other stuff. So the amount of flexibility built into the game system is reasonably good, and that's one way in which I prefer it very much to Rising Sun, because Rising Sun is very much about not being able to do whatever it is you need to do. You're only going to move your troops when a martial mandate is picked. You're only going to be able to put more guys out when a recruit mandate is taken. Whereas in Lords of Hellas, if you have, especially if you've devoted some resources into doing this, everybody has some degree of flexibility. But if you've really focused on amping up your flexibility, well then, you'll be able to do a lot more over the course of your ra- your turns. And so the game system doesn't spend as much time fighting you as some of these other games do. I want to make sure we note on the building of the monument phase that you actually build the monument (laughs) because these three Greek gods actually come in four parts and you actually build these giant things at least eight inches tall. That's an, you know, an exaggeration, but they're very, these giant things on the map and they're fantastic models. And I think it's really neat that you're actually physically building these monuments up. It's a tiny bit of a shame that completing one of them, building them all in their glory, does signal that the end of the game is coming. But I'm not going to gripe about it because they, they really are very attractive pieces. And I think it, they, they do an excellent job of communicating the kind of stature of, of divinity. So I'm going to keep on the, on the flexibility thing. What do you think about the map and, and how in lots of games, like Rising Sun, there's quite a few uh, sea zones and Kemet, you can almost go anywhere you want. Do you feel as though you're locked in in this game more than than usual? I think it's fine. I prefer games like Kemet or Senji where if you're willing to devote the resources, you can get where you need to go. It is sometimes the case in Lords of Hellas that you have the classic refrain of this guy's winning, you're the only one that can stop him. And I really don't like it when that happens. It is possible sometimes to get locked out of a certain region if you're not careful about where you go. But all of that having been said, that's a function of the map. There are a whole bunch of powers that really change up this this formula. There are gods that if the monument is, is high, if the, 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 the monument to Hermes has been raised up enough, you can go more or less wherever you want. If it's the case that you have the right blessings card, you can more or less teleport. So 
yes, you can end up behind the eight ball and be locked out of a region, but usually you have, you've had several opportunities, both in terms of the map placement and in terms of power selection to counteract that. So in overall, I think it's fine. I just want to go over the powers because I think for introducing people to this game or trying to teach this game, I think there might be a glut of things that are going to affect the game state. Because first of all, each hero has two abilities, one that's going to change how they start, one that's going to go on for the whole game. Then there's the blessings, then there's the artifacts, then there's each god has an artifact that you can get, plus there's the powers that the gods have change as you build them up. Then there's all the abilities that you're going to get from each monster. They also have artifacts that you can get from them. Then the benefits that you get from all the quests, right? So there's all these different things that are going to change the game state constantly. And I'm wondering if that is just too much. My experience showing it to people has been that the sort of aha moments where things happen that they didn't necessarily fully expect were less about the game mechanisms fighting them and more about just the actions of other players, which is very much the way that I want it to be. And again, to compare it to Rising Sun, and Lords of Alice and Rising Sun are very different in a lot of ways, but one of the things that I've said about Rising Sun, and I still stand by, is that the way the systems interact with each other is very, very opaque. And some of the systems aren't even explicit game systems, things like seating order, or the overall turn structure, or who's going to get more mandates in a round, and all these all these things where someone realizes that they've been completely shafted because they weren't able to identify how the different gears were interacting with each other. In Lords of Hellas, there are a lot of different things going on. The subsystems are different, but they don't interact in these opaque ways that I find a lot of other games do. So, for example, yes, it is the case that there might be two quests and three different monsters on the board, and all of those do different things at various times. But if it's the case that you want to focus and do, I'm going to try to go kill that monster, it's not the case that it's like, oh, well, you know, sorry, but this is the second round and you're third in the seeding order. So this thing is going to happen to make sure that you can't do that. You don't get those kinds of aha moments. No, for sure. This is a game where if you have a mission, you really want to go kill monsters, then you can do that. And not anyone can stop you. Or if you want to do these certain things, then this game, the game's not going to fight you to do that, nor can people really stand in your way other than, you know, the normal game mechanisms. So you never feel handcuffed very much in this game at all, unlike the other games that you mentioned. Yeah, some of the powers are going to show up. And if you forget about what certain powers do, then yes, you can be surprised in that way. And some of the powers are, are, are crushing. But one hopes that if you've been playing properly, you also have your own bag of dirty tricks. And you'll be able to deploy them in proper circumstances. And, you know, like any other game of special powers, Lords of Hellas is about leveraging your powers in a way that, that suit your advantage. And given that there are four different victory conditions, and this actually is one of the ways in which I think new players might be a little bit stymied. Because there are four different victory conditions, there's, there, there's kind of an inflection point which is the expression of the day, where you have to shift from generally faffing about and getting sort of a base of influence to figuring out which are the ways that I might possibly win and then driving towards that. But that's just a question of experience and knowledge of how the game, the, the, the tempo and the overall structure of how a game session is going to go. And I think that in this case, it's kind of equally a strength and a weakness. It's a weakness because new players are probably not going to see the bigger picture, but it's a strength because maybe you don't want a game that's perfectly transparent from the initial play and rewarding experience can be a good thing. So let's move on to combat, the combat system in this game. Much like in most dudes on a map game, when you move into a territory that you know has enemy troops in it, there's going to be a fight. And then you're going to play some cards and you're just going to do basic math and whoever has the higher number is going to win. I felt as though they could have done something a little bit more exciting. What do you think of the combat system overall? So combat in Lords of Alice can't last too long because it's possible over the course of your turn that you can literally, without any special powers, start three different fights. One from a priest action, one from your just moving hoplites that you get to do for free, and one from a march action. That's even ignoring, again, all the various special powers that might start more fights. So I don't begrudge them the fact that the combat system is relatively straightforward. There are some trade-offs involved. Some combat cards that you can play are very, very powerful but cause you to die. So it's a bit like the trade-off introduced in some of the combat cards in Kemet, where how much do I need to win the fight? How much do I care about my guys dying? Questions like that. Being able to control how many casualties you take or or give didn't seem to be there. Like, you can sort of control how many you're going to take because some of your combat cards have skulls on them and, mean, and, and you can only play as many as you have troops. And for everyone you play, you have to kill one of your guys. But trying to kill your enemy's troops is a little harder. Sure, which is fine. I mean, I, I, I kind of appreciate the fact that if one player gets 
you know, bluntly picked on. There's not a whole heck of a lot that you can do to destroy their military capability, which is something that I, I actually wanted to, to emphasize. Unlike all the other games we've been talking about, Lords of Hellas doesn't really have resources past combat cards. You don't spend anything for anything. There's no money, there's no prayer points, there's no energy, there's nothing like that. The only expendable resource that you have that's even remotely resembling a currency are these combat cards. But even then, lots of these other games that also have resources, whether it's rage or energy or what have you, they also have cards that, that, that can be spent. So in that sense, that's, that, that's a way in which the economy is kind of stripped down. To dovetail with that, the combat cards can be used for lots of different things. The combat cards can be used to satisfy the requirements of a quest. The combat cards can be used to hunt monsters. They can be used in fights. And so I do appreciate the fact that the economy is so parsimonious. It really is a nice breath of fresh air. And whether you wish to make a a given engagement a long, protracted, drag-out fight where you play lots of cards or not is very much a question of what else you need to to get done. And so I agree that the combat system is relatively simple, but I don't have any problem with that. Let's go on. Since we're talking about the combat cards and killing monsters, killing monsters, very interesting. They have these cool, what they call the rack. And it has all the different symbols, like the, like Mark said, they're multi-use combat cards, and they all have different symbols on them, be they bows or maces or flamethrowers or power swords or beers and axes, all sorts of different weapons. And it'll tell you on the card all the different combinations that you need to kill particular monsters. So when you go into a fight, you're going to cause some wounds with the monsters you have, and depending on how you do, you get you may or may not be able to draw some more cards. And either you're going to be successful or not. And then maybe someone will come in and snipe your monster. But other than that, I think that was my favorite part of the game for sure. I'm of two minds with respect to the monster hunting. On the one hand, I I love it. The monsters are these beautiful large figures out of Greek mythology. You can go and have your hero confront the Medusa or the Hydra or the Minotaur or what have you in this epic fight where you might get big rewards. And that's all great. However... I have a couple of problems. One of them is it more than anything else. The monster fighting in Lords of Hellas busts up the tempo of the game. It's a mini game where one player is doing a lot of stuff. One player to the left is doing a tiny little bit of stuff and nobody else is doing anything. And they do take a little bit of time. There's a little, it's not super fiddly, but there's a little bit of card drawing and card cycling and deciding what to do and how to do it. So it's the worst element of the game's tempo. It's also the case, and I will admit that this objection is theoretical. It's never actually manifested in the game. If somebody isn't careful, yes, their monster kill can be sniped. Basically, the way monster hunting hunting works is whoever gets the last hit is going to get credited for killing the monster. And generally speaking, there is no additional benefit from dealing one wound or N-1 wounds. So you really want to do either one wound or kill it outright. Going, going right up to the finish line and then leaving one wound left is asking for trouble. I've never seen anyone do that, though, because it's such an obvious glaring mistake. So really what I think you need to emphasize to new players is you either go in for one simple objective, and indeed, fighting monsters and just doing one wound can be great. You can get an artifact or a priest, which is very, very valuable, and you can just get a fistful of combat cards, which which is also good. And, you know, it's vaguely thematic. The, the, the hero gets all buffed up from, you know, tussling with whatever. Or you kill it outright to, to pursue the victory conditions. I think the the temptation to go halfway or to press your luck in ways that are unwise can have potentially degenerate effects on the game state. I've never seen it happen. I saw it almost happen once. There was one monster fight where someone stayed in far too long, but then they were able to finish it off themselves. So sniping is a theoretical possibility that still kind of concerns me, but it hasn't actually shown up. So there's another thing that I think new players need to be warned about, because again, knowing where the victory conditions might pop up can be a little bit daunting for new players. Uh, We've seen a game end a couple times by somebody capturing all the green and brown territories. Basically, the way the map works, there's the southern area of the map, and there are a couple choke points uh, to get in there. And if you just leave somebody alone, it's relatively easy to, to, to for them to just gobble up other territory in the south. In the middle, obviously, you're in the middle. There's going to be a lot of fighting over there. And in the north, there's not as much ground in the north to be left alone and do it. 
so you know that might be something to flag in addition to the to the, to the monster sniping. I've also got a little bit of a pet peeve in terms of how the rules are presented uh, because we've talked a lot about rule books on the podcast for good reason. They're they're a substantial part of the the hobby. There are a couple things that I, I think are very problematic about the rule book. One of them is not all the rules are in the right place. It you know in order to find out how to refresh artifacts, it's not listed under the phase when it happens. It's instead listed under artifacts centrally. So that that's that's a bit obnoxious. And there are a couple of other weird corner cases, especially as as relates to the solo game where the rules are not presented in a particularly good way. The other thing, and this is very much a pers- personal pet peeve, the rule book spends so much time patting itself on the damn back about, oh, you know, the strategic depth of this game, and there's so much going on, and it's going to be daunting and epic, and you're going to love it so much. Like, dude, shut up and tell me how to play the game. I'm going to make my own damn opinions about how epic or good the game is. And in point of fact, you going on and on about how great it is it's, is more likely to make me think less of the game, not more of it. All right, since we're going on about pet peeves, I'll go my biggest one, which you, I'm sure, disagree with totally, are these things called glory tokens. Now, you get these glory tokens by completing quests. This again? Yes, the damn glory tokens. God! Whenever you complete a quest or kill a monster, you're going to get a glory token corresponding to the color of the territory that you did this action in. And it seems like it's going to be this fabulous thing. It's called a glory token, for God's sakes. You'd think you'd be able to do something with this glory. You've done something fantastic. You've completed a quest or you've killed a monster and you've gotten this reward called a glory token. So what can you do with this glory token? Well, it's pretty well only useful for one hero and or doing one major action, which is is the... You, I can never pronounce that right. Yeah, the fact that you can't pronounce it, I think, is, is, is the key element of er- usurp. <laughs> usurp. The usurp action, which... I don't even think it was used once in all of the games that we've played. I think it was it was threatened once, but then withdrawn. So then what are these glory tokens for then? I will grant you that the usurp action is a little bit tricky. The usurp action, you spend a glory token and you basically take any territory on, on, on the board, which is great. But the army that was sitting there before just relocates to an adjacent space most of the time. And so you have one puny guy waiting to be massacred. And so you're, it's probably going to be taken back. Look... Here's a, here are the things you need to know about the glory tokens, though. So I, I do have beefs with the usurp action. I think it's a bit wonky in most instances. And I think it's it's primarily intended as a way to snipe victory. You know, you're one territory away. You just play it and go get it. And indeed, that, that threat has influenced the game state. But just because it's called a glory token doesn't necessarily mean it has to be the, the be-all and end-all. No. And when you when you complete a quest or kill a monster, you get tons of other benefits besides. The glory token is just a side thing. I'm just wondering why it's there at all. But I'm just saying, it sort of feeds in to the fact. Well, look, but there are other effects as well. I, there are combat cards that work better if you have the glory token there. There is, as you say, the hero that cares about the glory token. The glory tokens are also used rather interestingly in the solo game, but that's not necessarily of interest to you. But I think that's a bad thing, the thing where it feeds into a hero. Because I think it unbalances that hero. It makes that hero way more useful. Because this hero can use these glory tokens to get an artifact. Not only that, this hero starts off with a with a strength stat, which helps him kill monsters, which gets him these glory tokens, which gets him more artifacts. So you're talking about Heracles. I have not seen Heracles be unbalanced. I think all of the heroes are really, really good. Achilles is wonderful at winning fights. Helen is very, very strong on the defense. And Perseus gets to go wherever he wants. All of these are great attributes. Yes, all the heroes are very strong, but I, I haven't... I haven't seen Heracles win a No, no, I'm, I'm not games. saying it's a, it's a huge flaw or anything. You I'm just really saying. want the glory tokens to do something different. That's right. I wish they had. I wish you could cash them in to do anything. It's the fact that you need to also, you need, not only you have to use one of your main actions to do this, it, it seems a, a very fiddly part of the game. You know, when I see something fiddly, that's when it starts grinding on my... Uh... I definitely agree that the usurp action is a bit strange... It doesn't deserve pride of place next to the other core actions like recruit or march or those other things. And if the game had been subject to a little bit more development work, I can easily see the usurp action having been filed straight away. The only other minor gripe I've got is the difference in the balance of all the different victory conditions. Like we already talked about this, the building of the monument was seven turns. Right, so you need four turns. No, is there four levels? The base, the fourth level. So you only have to build it three times. You, you have, have to build, build it four times. There's five levels. The base is five levels. level one. So each monument has five levels. So you have to take four of your main actions in order to build this monument up 
to its fullest height. Then you get a card which says now you must hold this monument for three turns in order to win the game. So that's a seven-turn investment, four of which you're using this main action to build the monument and therefore not being able to do anything else. All right. So this takes the classic form of, and this is not unique to Walker, this is very common, the I tried this strategy once and it didn't work so clearly it's not strong enough. Here's what I have to say about building monuments. First of all, if you are trying to rush the end game by building monuments, you are probably getting an income of priests. Yeah, that's a real rush. Seven turns. Whoo! Whoa, that game went quick. Moving on. (laughs) You're getting priests, and at that point, your priests will be able to do not only just stat bonuses, but little actions in and of themselves. And on top of that, you still get your normal hoplite movement, which can start a fight. You've still got your normal hero movement and all this other stuff. So you're not foregoing a tremendous quantity of actions in order to do this. And in point of fact, by virtue of the fact that you're probably going to be drowning in priests, you might indeed have a a tempo advantage on other players if they're not using their actions properly. But you won't be drowning in troops. The only way you can muster more troops is by doing a main action. That's not true. You can worship Athena. Athena will give you more troops. It is also the case that I think of the four victory conditions, the holding a monument seems to be the if all else fails, because you will inevitably move to a conclusion of a monument being completed. There's no way to avoid it. Every The monuments do get built up at a, at a certain rate, maybe faster or slower, depending on your choices, but they do get built up inevitably. And so it is the case that there has to be some sort of if all else fails, there's an endgame condition. Well, there doesn't have to be, but generally speaking, it's advantageous. And so based on our experiences, it does seem to be that the three other victory conditions in Lords of Hellas are the primary ones. And the holding a completed monument is really sort of the, well, if nobody else is ever able to get their stuff together, if the map is too crowded and there aren't enough temples on the board and no one's able to get it, get it done and there aren't enough monsters on the board, or maybe, you know, enough people have killed enough monsters if everybody's killed two monsters and there's no more monsters left to kill, obviously that's not going to happen. So there has to be something left, and it's it's the thing that's left over. That's generally been a, been our experience anyway. I agree. And as I was looking at it, while I was building it, I can see while people are trying to take it from you, then you can sort of side maneuver and, and take, like, you know, the five temples or whatever, you know what I mean? So that I could see different strategies coming from that for sure. I, I do want to get your opinion on the killing of the three monsters victory condition. Sure. Because I think out of the th- out of the four that are there, it is the one that you cannot stop people from completing, except for the fact that you can you can you could attack them and maybe reduce their hand of combat cards, but because you cannot hinder the hero movement or attack the hero or fight the hero in any way, he can pretty well go unstoppable around and kill monsters as he, as he wishes. So I'm wondering, what do you think of that? I'd say the ways to interfere with a player pursuing that strategy are a little more indirect. There are ways to cause wounds to that character. And if you wound wound them often enough or bad enough, then they're not going to be able to chase the monsters around the map or engage them successfully. So that's one way you can do it. You can try to manipulate what the monster is going to be doing by taking lots of build artifact actions. Because every time you build an art... uh, Sorry... By taking a lot of build monument actions. Because every time you take a build monument action, you might activate a whole bunch of monsters. You can kill the monster yourself, which might or might not be available to you. So I I agree that it's it's a little less direct than, you know, just simply going and taking one of their territories. But I disagree that it's impossible to stop them. Not impossible. I mean, just a lot more difficult than the other victory conditions. Yeah, that is one of those areas where I think more experience would be helpful than in other areas and perhaps might not be perfectly transparent to people newer to the game. Uh, In particular, there's uh, an artifact that is in every game uh, that corresponds to Zeus that allows you to wound a hero. And if you're consistently wounding a hero that is needs to go out and and kill monsters, it's going to ruin their day and they're not going to be able to get it done fast enough. I think this might be one of those rare cases where I'm more enthusiastic about a game than Walker is. So mark it in your calendars. I don't think that it's a brilliant game, but I do think it can stand shoulder to shoulder with the other top tier games of this kind of genre of, as as we say, dudes on a map with lots of other stuff. I do like the other stuff. I do like the way it handles dudes on a map. It doesn't really do a whole heck of a lot to address some of the multiplayer conflict problems, but it does enough to address enough of them that I think it works well. And there's enough other stuff going on. 
And I mean, just look, hunting monsters and building monuments to a to a badass techno Athena. It's just it's just it's just fun to do. It's cool. I like it. It speaks to me on a fundamental level. And I think that the where the opacity comes in is the kind of opacity I like. Opacity about understanding the tempo of a game rather than understanding things like, oh, my seating order interacts with the way this mandate was picked or what have you, or knowing the composition of a draw deck in the case of Blood Rage. Not that I necessarily dislike those other games, but in the way that uh, I, I think that in the ways that Lords of Hellas are complicated or the good kind of complicated. No, I agree with all those points for sure. I definitely want to play it again. And I really think it benefits from multiple plays, especially with the, not, I shouldn't say with the same group, but with people who have played before, like introducing new people or having new people come in, I think is going to just take away from that. So we both like Lords of Hellas. Very nice. Very nice. Very nice. I thought I was going to derail this hype train, but that last game we played was a fabulous game. So we should talk a little bit about the scaling, I suppose. We haven't played it two-player. I don't think it would be very good two-player, quite frankly. The map does not scale with the number of players. Three-player is shockingly good. I don't think it loses a whole heck of a lot. Four-player is probably best. And as I say, w- except when you're hunting monsters, the game flows so smoothly and so quickly, there's not a whole lot of downtime. There's going to be a fifth and sixth-player expansions. I'm interested in trying it with five. I'm not optimistic about six, but I'd be willing to try it. And I will give a shout-out to the solo game. The solo game, although not particularly compelling when compared to the, the, the true titans of solo uh, solo games, a lot of thought went into it. And although the rules presentation is a bit of a mess, it's kind of cute in a number of ways, and I'm glad I tried it the once. I probably won't try it again, but it's, it's at least an interesting sort of uh, setup. All right, so like we said, scales well. Timing is great. I never felt as though it never went too, it went too long. That is Lords of Hellas. Give it a try. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to some of the expansions. Now on to the topic of the week, which is expansions. And why do we need more players in a game? (laughs) Well, this is actually more to the point. I think we're going to be focusing on instances where expansions can be a detriment to the game. We're not just going to be talking about, you know, the joy of, of, of expanding a good game. But sometimes expansions, I think, are... 100% 100% necessary to fix a game. Fantasy Flight was infamous for this back in the day. You know, the first edition of the Warcraft game, first edition of a Game of Thrones were broken out of the box, and so they needed an expansion to fix it. So that obviously is both a blessing and a curse. It's a good expansion, but you probably shouldn't have needed to do that in the first place. <laughs> That's what I was, was going to tie into the same thing with the Kickstarter, is that I'm wondering if some of these some of these games seem rushed, and then they have to bring in an expansion to fix it. Well, so few that, that's one of the problems actually with Kickstarter. So few Kickstarter games get post launch support. And this is kind of combining a whole bunch of topics into one and including bitching about Kickstarter. When a game like Lords of Hellas, for example, or almost any Simon game launches with three or four or five or six expansions right at launch, there are a couple of problems with this. One of them is, as I say, you might not get post-launch support and so the game just seems to arrive in a blaze of glory and then there's no more there's no more time for more thoughtful development of of expansions but also for lack of better term it seems to indicate a lack of editorial control if you're opening up a game and you've got all these different modules involved and this isn't unique to kickstarter i i I find sometimes the same problem uh, applies to the commit with the tacity expansion if you've got about half dozen different modules that can be added into the game it's often difficult to know what to do and the impulse for some people is to include everything right from the start which is often a, a very very bad impulse and can lead to very bad experiences but if you're a new player and often a game only has one or two chances to make a good impression sometimes you know and this is this is this is true whether you've got a big collection or a small collection if you play a game and it's not good it doesn't matter how many games you've got access to you're probably not going to you're not probably not going to make the effort to try it in every possible configuration so i really wish sometimes that games, instead of offering you this tremendous menu of half a dozen different ways to play, instead put their best foot forward, or at the very least try to issue some sort of editorial guidance about what they think is the ideal setup for making the game sing. Instead, all we get is the traditional advice like, play without expansions your first time. And usually that's good advice, but sometimes it's not. 
Yeah, or like a little card that says what this expansion includes and how it changes the gameplay. Like this will make it go faster. This will, you know, make the resources, you know, flow easier. Just stuff like that would be amazing. I just want to say on Kickstarter, one more quick point about Kickstarter, and then we'll we'll stop beating on poor Kickstarter. Sometimes I wonder if some of the game, sometimes games are split up pers- purposely in order for, uh, to say, either get add-ons or to get stretch goals. I guess that's all. But he just Mark agrees. Yeah, it's entirely possible. Look, I mean, companies like Colmany or not know exact know within a certain degree of latitude how much money they're going to raise, and so they need they know they need a certain amount of stretch goals in order to make things work. Sometimes this results in games that I think are just kind of overloaded with too many options, like I was talking about. Zombicide is a good example of this. Once you get, you know, four or five or six or seven different types of enemy types that might be able to spawn it, it really kind of undercuts the, 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 the core simplicity of a game like Zombicide. Massive Darkness, on the other hand, I think does it relatively well. I'm in favor of expansions that I would, I would classify as yet more stuff. If the, game, if the core game is good and you're able to... Imp- involve all this additional material relatively straightforwardly, then I say go for it. And Massive Darkness does this well. You just Everything goes into a st- standard deck, and all the stats are on the cards themselves, rather than having to remember the way different abominations and different zombie types work in Zombicide. Deck builders are the classic example of this. If you it doesn't matter whether you have one stack of cards, as, as some of the deck builders like Mystic Veil vale or like Ascension does, you can shuffle it all into the standard deck. Or if it's just the classic Dominion model, where you just have you know ten village cards, but the more the merrier. Just if your randomization metric is decent, then I say go ahead. It's yeah, right. Some games are just more compliant to expansions than others, like you said, like campaign games where you're just adding more characters, where you're not changing the core mechanisms of the game. Oh, yeah, always more characters. I'm always in favor of there being more characters available. But then you brought up Dominion. And I want to look, is it like, aren't some expansions just too many? Like, how many expansions do you need of Dominion before it just gets, you know, too many? Okay, so there it's just a question of storage and transportation, right? Past that, I don't see any problem with effectively an unlimited number of village cards. True, but like, how many times can you, like, mix it up that you're not. I, I guess. I'm wondering, maybe we just have so many games to play. I guess if a group just plays Dominion a lot, then they're going to get all the different combinations off. But if you're only playing Dominion, you know, if you have like 10 different sets, like how many different combinations can you get before you've played them all? But you don't have to play them all. No. Certainly but, not all the combinations. But I just mean like even with three sets, the combinations are are huge. Why do you need seven sets? Because more is more. More is more. How about Seven Wonders? They're going for seven expansions for Seven Wonders. Yeah, that, that's an example. You brought this up before, and I think that's a good example of sometimes games, uh, you know, have a virtue of their simplicity. And when you're at cr- when you're really trying to latch on and ciliary bolted on stuff, it doesn't really work. My classic example of this is actually Keyflower. I like Keyflower. I also like the Keyflower expansions, but when I'm playing the farmers or I'm playing the merchants, I often feel, do I really need to be rearing pigs in this game? Is this really what the game wanted? And, I mean, usually the answer is no. I do like having additional tile variety. I do like being able to do extra things, but I do feel like the additional mechanisms don't fit seamlessly into the core product, and that's that. That seems to be how you feel about Seven Wonders. That's true. Seven Wonders, other games like that, like Carcassonne, are games that really pull from the simplicity. They make games like uh, King Domino. They shine because of how basic they are. You take it out, you play it, and then you're done. And then these companies bring out these expansions, and they try to make a game more than it is. And that's and then and it takes away from what what they've developed in the first place. Sure, but some simple games can thrive on masses of expansions. I mean, we both have, I think, relatively complete sets of Sentinels of the Multiverse, for example. And that's a very simple game, and it's just a, a question of the, the the basic, with the exception of the of the villains expansion, where you play with a whole bunch of different villains, which is not a mode that I appreciate in Sentinels. I think it leads to too much upkeep. With the exception of that. The core rules of Sentinels haven't changed at all. Well, that's what I mean. That's just more what we talked about before, right? That's just more stuff. Yeah. More characters, more villains, right? It doesn't change the core mechanisms of the game. Right. And and that's my point. The same point I made about Dominion can be applied to Sentinels. More is more. The Dominion works there, too. But I'm saying games like Seven Wonders where they bring things in that change the core. Like Queen Domino. That's another game I didn't talk about that I did play this week that I think... You've been holding out on us, Walker. I'm sorry. That... That is, it's fine. Queen Domino's fine. 
But I think they it took away from what King Domino is, just this basic tile lane, and they just try to add these more rules, and I think it just bogs the game down and, and doesn't make it as fun as it was. I, I don't have an opinion. I haven't tried. But again, short of component barriers, some games I think can be expanded ad, ad infinitum. There's one game that uh, in particular I wish – could be a little bit more easily transported and used, and that's specifically a small world. I think small world, again, you can benefit from an effectively unlimited number of powers and different races. The problem is carting it all together, and I haven't found a good good storage solution for myself. Uh, But past that, I mean, the, 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 the fact that I'm able to get all of Sentinels of the Multiverse into a couple boxes, the fact that I'm able to get all of Rum and Bones, which is another game with an infinite number of characters that don't really change the, the rule set, into a couple boxes makes me very pleased. And it just leads to, to variety without too much it, things being too cumbersome. Unlike, again, some other games where the variety is about setting out a whole new module the Arkham Horror expansions are like that, for example. I'm, I, I never really liked Arkham Horror to begin with, but one of the things that drove me crazy about the expansions was they would just introduce – it was it was sort of the combination of all the bad things that an expansion can do. Too many bits, additional rule systems that often don't feel that they, they, they mesh into things, too many play modes where you didn't really know what to do or, or how to involve them, and again – and this isn't a problem with the game, a problem more of some fans of the game – some people – having the strong desire to play with all of them at once, which is just an act of sheer madness. So I definitely prefer when as little violence is done as possible to the core rules if you're going to have, like, a bunch of expansions. Cosmic Encounter is the same way. Every Cosmic Encounter expansion has more aliens, which is always for the good. Sometimes they introduce new play modes, which kind of bumps up a little bit against what I was talking about, a you know, lack of editorial control, but I'll always take more aliens for Cosmic Encounter. And I think you're on the same page as I am. When an expansion comes in, it goes into the main box, and the expansion box gets chucked in the garbage. Yeah, whenever possible. I, I know many people who keep the expansion separate in its own box, and I don't know why it drives me crazy, but it drives me crazy. Eh, I mean, wh- whatever floats your boat. I'd like to, to segue a little bit into expansions that I find uh, fascinating when they're able to be done well, which is rarely, and that is where they really change the core rules and feel of the game without necessarily adding more mechanisms, just changing a lot of the mechanisms. And the, the best example of this is some of the El Grande expansions. El Grande feels very different whether you're playing the, the base game or Intrigue in the King because it changes the fundamental action selection of the game. It doesn't introduce a new phase. It doesn't introduce a new action selection. What it does is it just changes the action selection fundamentally. And so it really, really flips a lot of where the control axes are, and I find it a fascinating difference. Uh, a, a game that probably you'll be able to appreciate more in this vein is different boards to a game sometimes really, really change how the game feels. Yeah, I was going to bring that up. Hansa Teutonica, yeah. I think, is a good example of this. Age of Industry is another good example of this. Some of the Age of Industry boards are really interesting in terms of how they, they, they change the fundamental feel of the game. And sometimes extra boards are, like the Arkham Horror expansions, just more stuff. But sometimes it's just a fundamental change to some of the, 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 key, the key structures. And in a game that is already interesting, I'm always willing to, to, to give a, a shot to new boards like that. Formula Day, new boards, expansions is a must. Sure, if you like Formula Day. If you like Formula Day. Yeah. So there's one expansion I'd just like to highlight for uh, the, the, the beneficial effect on the game, and sometimes expansions just increase the flexibility. They really give you more options. Now, of course, usually this comes with an increased rules overhead, but sometimes it's worth it. And one I think that really strikes the right balance is the first expansion of Core Worlds, Galactic Orders. Because Core Worlds is a very, very good game, but it's very tight. If you're off by one on a single axis, you can be stymied and not be able to do something for a given round, which is okay. You know, there's planning involved, and sometimes your plans don't work out. But the the thing that I like most about the Galactic Orders expansion to Core Worlds is it gives you a little bit of extra flexibility. If you really need one more, whether it's energy or combat strength or something, you might have access to an ability to spend that and cash in some resources to do that by virtue of your influence on the orders. And so some, I, don't, I don't always object to new rules, mechanisms introduced in expansions. Sometimes they work fine, even when the base game was solid. But usually if it's relatively straightforward and it increases your flexibility, that's usually the kind of expansion I really like. A counterpoint to the Core Worlds Galactic Orders expansion is... You know, sometimes expansions try to do the same thing, but kind of overbake the design. 
Uh, an example, this is a relatively obscure game, but it's one that I like, and I should really introduce it to you. You might like it. It's called uh, Bushido, The Way of the Warrior. It's, it's in German, Der Victor Des Kriegers. Its expansion, 10 in The Stranger, really gives you some flexibility because you're able to develop crappy land tiles. If you're stuck in crappy land, you can spend some resources and develop the land and make it slightly better and give you some more options that way. Unfortunately, in the process, they didn't just introduce that. They introduced half a dozen new tiles that each have special effects. And so it's very, very difficult to keep it all straight, especially for new players, but even for experienced players. And sometimes I wish, I, I, this is me being, of course, a complete hypocrite, allow me to completely contradict myself from what I said before. Sometimes I wish that you could actually extract some of the bits of an expansion from the rest of the bits and just have the stuff that gives you a little more flexibility. So, of course, I want exactly what I want, and I will complain if I don't get exactly what I want, and I will assert that it's because it fails objectively. Exactly. So on that note of utter hypocrisy and self-awareness, thank you very much for joining us for So Very Wrong About Games. If you'd like to get in touch with us, first a reminder that we are giving away a copy of Massive Darkness. Please shoot us an email if you're interested in winning instructions we're at the beginning of the podcast. I'm not going to repeat them because I value your time. You can reach Walker via his email, justrolledadice at gmail.com. That's J-U-S-T-R-O-L-L-D-A-D-I-C-E at gmail.com. You can reach me, Mark Bigney, on Twitter at the games you like. For more public discussion, you can find the So Very Wrong About Games Facebook page, or you can check out our Board Game Geek Guild, which is guild number 3236. That's 3236. We read absolutely everything you send us, and we will get back to you if we possibly can. Thanks once again for tuning in. We really appreciate it, and we hope to see you again soon. We'll see you next week, and I'll put all the information on our Facebook page and in the guild about the contest. And if you like this podcast, tell a friend. Take care. You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bigney. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time, and always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong.